Every year I know we gonna go hard. We been that team ever since Bart Star. All my cheese heads go pack go. Ain't show with no mercy, cutting no slack, no. I ain't a bad sport and I'll even wish you good luck. Only thing I will All right, welcome to Lombardi's Legends Podcast. It's Dane and Wags, and um, I mean, we have an incredibly special guest, a man who needs no introduction, but I'm going to do it anyway. Wayne Larrabee, the voice of the Green Bay Packers. Wayne, welcome to the pod. How you doing, man? Good, Dane and Andrew. Good to be with you guys. Oh my gosh. I mean, this is uh, Wayne Mount Rushmore uh, of, of Green Bay Packer guests we could possibly have. You are squarely on it. Um, so we got to ask, uh, we always ask players, uh, the first question is, how does it feel to be a Green Bay Packer? Um, you are so much part of the lore of the Packers. So Wayne, how does it feel to be so synonymous with the Green Bay Packer organization? Well, first off, if I'm at the one of the top uh, guests you've had, you've got to get a better guest list <laughs> in the future, <laughs> and I'm sure you will. Um, but no, uh, it's been great. It's been an honor. Um, it's something I've always wanted to do in my career, and for 25 years, I've had a chance to do it with Larry McCarron and broadcast games on Sunday afternoon. And you know, um, it's really I'm in awe of becoming part of the fabric of of the Packers in, in, you know, Green Bay Sunday afternoon tradition, all that goes with it. And uh, to me, I, I grew up a, as a kid, a Packers fan. So it's been a thrill all the way along. Yeah, Wayne. And I think we're going to get into some of the uh, Packer talk in a moment, but first we got to understand if you just conjured up all of the snow that's coming into Wisconsin and across the U S here, uh, it's April and uh, we're supposed to be getting spring weather, but you've been doing ski bum tour 2024 and the off season. Yeah. So can you tell us the uh, the latest and I just really want to hear how everything's been going with, with all that uh, touring around and, and, and some, some looks like you've got some nice laps in uh, even with some of the sparser snow earlier in the season. Yeah. You know, um, uh, we've kind of missed uh, the good days. Let me explain to you. Um, I've seen when I've skied this year and I've skied about 20 times or more, uh, I've seen the sun five times. And people say, well, well, don't you want to be skiing when it's snowing out and it's great and you got that fresh powder and all? No. Anyone who skis knows you don't want to be skiing when you can't see the snow. And I've skied a lot in those conditions. Now, um, we begin in the southeast uh, Wisconsin. Um, you know, my uh, grandson's home hill is, is Cascade outside Madison. Um, we ski Alpine. We start with Alpine. Then we usually go up north. To what used to be Indian Head and Blackjack, but now is I think Snow River is what they call it. And I got to tell you something: in skiing in three different parts of the country, the Midwest, the East Coast, and the uh, West, the Rockies, the best snow we had this winter was up in the Upper Peninsula. We got a freak little six-inch storm off of uh, Lake Superior, and that delivered some of the uh, lightest, freshest powder we saw all winter. So that was back in early February. Um, went to New England in early March and got just terrible conditions out there. Um, they were really in a drought. And, you know, some of the ski areas that you just looked at it, I said to the guy at Stowe, I said, you guys going to be lucky to make uh, St. Patrick's Day, much less April. And um, so, you know, we skied some bad snow there, got a snowstorm the last day we were there at Killington and Pico. And, you know, it was one of these heavy spring storms. You don't want to be skiing in those things. That's not fun. That's work. That's a lot of physical labor. And so we leave there. And when we leave there, all of a sudden, they start getting the goods, as we say in the ski business. They started getting a lot of snow. And uh, so I said, well, not to worry. We're going to Park City. Park City, Utah, usually the best snow on earth. And uh, we got out there, and we had snow, plenty of it. And we kept getting snow, but it was kind of that heavy March stuff, you know, that only sticks to snow. But again, and saw two days, we're out there for 10 days, saw two days of sunshine. Um, not one of those days was a bluebird day where there was no cloud in the sky. So we leave there about, a, you know, four days ago, five days ago. And now they've been getting sunshine and beautiful spring skiing conditions. So <laughs> I've been in one of these ruts, guys, where on the ski bum tour, we were missing the optimal conditions no matter where we were. <laughs> it seemed like just one of those years. 
But I will say this as a skier, okay, and I, I'm not getting political here, but this uh, global warming stuff, this, uh, what, what's the proper word? Uh, global warming is a bad uh, term to use. But climate, change, climate change, Wayne. Climate change is the word of the climate day. Climate change is real. And I'm telling you, 9,000, 10,000 feet up in the Rockies, the snow is not as light and not as fluffy and not as good as it used to be. And that's climate change. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, oh, and Wayne, 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 I was just going to say, and I'm sorry to interrupt, Dane, but, um, you know, I, I think the, the key is you got to find one spot and stay there all winter. That's the way I do it, Wayne. I, I spent a, a winter in, in Jackson Hole. Uh, and, and I, I got plenty of good snow because you can pick and choose which days you go yeah. out there. Uh, but I'll tell you what, I thought that was the best snow, uh, and I'd ever seen, but, uh, Taos and uh, angel fire hidden gem down in the Northeast New Mexico. So I don't know if you've ever gotten to ski out there, but boy, they got some, some light champagne snow out there. And, and that's, that's, uh, uh, truly a pleasure to get out there as well. But Dan, I'll, I'll turn it over to you to the question you had. I'm sorry. Well, I just, I, I, how long have you been skiing, Wayne? And, 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 you know, Wags is touching on some of these, these Western gems uh, of the ski industry. Um, what's the best place you've ever been to? Or, you know, maybe that's a hard question, but top two or top three resorts or mountains that you've had an opportunity to ski in your lifetime? Well, I grew up on skis in Western Massachusetts at a place called Bosque, one of the oldest ski areas in the country. And, um, you know, so we know bad snow in southern New England. Um, my dad was a ski patrolman. And um, that was back in the day where, you know, he was a, a paper mill executive, but he was a, he really loved to ski. And he became a ski patrolman so that all of us in the family, his pay was us getting season passes. And so um, that was a treat. That was great. And, and we all, my sisters and I, we still get together once a year in Park City, uh, my two siblings and I. And uh, we kind of, you know, reflect back on that. And but that's my dad got us into skiing and my mom yanked us up to the ski hill for the <laughs> lessons and all that stuff. So it was really a family affair. And then, you know, I moved, to, you know, out west after college and you know, I used to ski Colorado all the time. Uh, the summit areas mostly, um, you know, but of late I've gone, uh, I went down to um, Telluride. And the San Juan Mountains are really, you know, and I know Jackson Hole is spectacular. I was there this summer. Um, but the San Juans might be the most um, spectacular looking mountains you'll see anywhere. I mean, they're all peaks. You know, when we say peak, we're talking peak. It's pointed at the top and, and you can barely stand up there. But um, it, it's just it's great areas. There's just a lot of good snow. I thought the areas I skied in, you know, I went back to New England for the first time this year in 40 years to ski. And I oh. said, you know, I don't really need to do this, but there are a couple of places I wanted to hit. I wanted to hit Stowe. I'd never skied there. And Jay Peak. And uh, caught them both on really bad days. Although at least we had sun at Jay Peak, but they had very bad, hard, car, hard pack snow. We used to call it ice. The ski people call it hard pack now. It's ice, trust me. And, you know, kind of mogully, and we, they didn't have a lot of cover, but we had a beautiful spring day um, to ski that. The, 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 earlier in the week, I skied Stowe coming off an inch and a half rainstorm driving in there the night before. Um, I will say this about, and then Killington obviously is the beast of the east. I would say this about those Vermont ski areas. They, if they had the elevation if, that the west has, those mountains are good mountains. I didn't realize how good they are. Um, and they are every bit up to scale with the West Western mountains. Problem is they're all at about, I don't know, 1500 vertical, the base and maybe to 3,200 at the summit. And my God, I mean, you know, the base at park city is 6,900 and uh, most of us are skiing over 8,100 and, and up, you know? So, um, that's the only thing about new England. That's, that's what, why new England snow isn't is good. Uh, as you get out west, but it's all about elevations. But there are a lot of great places to ski, and in the Midwest, I feel for our, our friends, the ski area operators here, especially in southern Wisconsin. This was a terrible winter. They did their best. They made snow. They they did all they could, but uh, it's just a tough winter. And hopefully, we'll get some better winters coming up for them. Um, but the the Rockies had snow. Uh, I wasn't. I wouldn't say it was the best snow uh, this year. Certainly wasn't in Park City. We ski Deer Valley, and that's my favorite ski area. And we 
uh, we have a place out there. And uh, so Deer Valley is where we always end up and, and we end up with a family trip there. Yeah, Wayne, and, and speaking of New England, um, I understand you grew up Massachusetts as a Yankees and Packers fan. Yeah. So I just, just out of curiosity, during that period, what were some defining moments for you that you remember as a Packer fan? Um, okay. Uh, you know, first off, growing up in Massachusetts as a Yankees and Packers fan, I am a contrarian. Okay. And so <laughs> <laughs> that's that's obvious and have always been. Um, but I'm going to tell you this story, and it's about the ice bowl. And the ice bowl is on a Sunday afternoon. It's New Year's Eve in uh, 1967. And it's it's a Sunday afternoon. So where are we? We're skiing, okay? And I remember my father had this little old red Mercury, and it, it was parked at the ski patrol shed. And so I, we skied in, I skied in the morning and that type of thing. And obviously he had to continue to patrol and work and all that. And I went to his car and got into the car, turned it on and listened to the game on the mutual broadcasting system. A guy by the name of Van Patrick was doing the play-by-play. -play. It was fantastic. It was as cold in Pittsfield, Massachusetts, as it was in Green Bay, Wisconsin. <laughs> Maybe we didn't have quite the wind they had in Green Bay, but I listened to that whole game, pictured it in my mind, um, and, and then, you know, I uh, was thrilled to get home and see the highlights on the news that night uh, of the game of what I listened to and envisioned. And that's, that was, um, a huge moment for me in, in, in my life as a Packers fan, because, you know, when all these people talk about the ice bowl and everybody claims they were there, uh, the stadium held a little under 50, around 50,000 and 50 million claim they were at the ice bowl. Um, I was but in a different kind of way. I was sitting in a cold car, freezing my butt off and listening to the game on the radio. And it was thrilling. Wait, do you think that that's a, uh, was that at the time a moment for you where, you know, that, that, that showed the passion of what you, you know, eventually become, you know, as, as the announcer, of the green Bay Packers, or what are, do, do you have any defining moments that brought you through your career to this moment? Or, you know, what, what was kind of the precursor for that? That team, um, you know, you have to understand back in the sixties, and you guys are too young to know this, but <laughs> those of us of a certain age, okay, let's go back. All right. What was coming up big in the sixties, big in the sixties were two things cable TV and color TV, okay? And you would go by hotels, and they would have on their sign, just above no vacancy or vacancy, they would have color TV on the sign. This was big, and most of us didn't have color TV. Um, I'll tell you how we got color TV in our house. It was in the mid-60s. Um, my grandfather, uh, who was a big Yankees fan, uh, and lived cross town with my aunt and uncle, um, he knew they weren't going to get cable, but he said to my dad, if you put in cable TV, I'll buy you a color TV. Well, he did, and he did, and Grandpa Giganti came up Thursday through Sunday and watched the Yankees on WPIX. That was in color TV. That's how we got color TV. Now, at this time, who, wh what team is, is evolving in the NFL? The NFL was made for color TV, and you had all these great teams, the Browns, the Giants, the Colts, and then the Packers, and, and I just love the colors of the Packers and the G on the side of the helmet as a kid. I'm talking about a little kid here. And I just said, wow, I love those colors. Green and gold became my favorite colors. I had a lunchbox, NFL lunchbox. Jim Taylor was on the cover of it in his green uniform with the helmet and the G on the side of it. That, that's what sold me on, on because that's how I became a Packers fan. And I'm one of these people, and my kids are like this too, who you become a fan of. At that early age, six, seven, or eight, whatever it is, you stay that. Well, you stay that fan the whole your whole life. So um, I'm still a fan of the Yankees and obviously the Packers. Yeah, and Wayne, I, I know you made a little bit more than a pit stop along the way. Obviously, starting a NFL uh, broadcasting career with the Chiefs, uh, and then with the Bears uh, for not a insignificant period of time, 14 years. We've heard you talk about before that you always wanted to take the Green Bay job. It, it wasn't a, a business decision, uh, but I'm just kind of curious more the mechanics of that. Was that something that you had feelers out and people in the Packers organization knew that you would always be interested and you were on their bench? Or uh, did you have to approach them at the time that 
that uh, you knew there was an opportunity. I, I'm just kind of curious how that actually worked behind the scenes uh, to, to transition from the voice of the Chicago Bears to yeah. uh, we know it was your dream job, but to actually mechanically make that move behind the scenes. Yeah, you know, um, th that was very interesting. And, and it probably, because of social media today, it probably can't be done again. Um, but again, so we we're very limited back then. Um, your your social media was sports talk radio, and there was some of that, and most of it was on weekends, Saturday, Sunday afternoons, uh, when the station didn't have a game. So you know, you didn't have all of this internet stuff going on. Um, you didn't have Twitter, and and you didn't have Facebook, and and none of that was happening. Um, but at any rate, yeah, when this job came available, the Packers had very little uh, to do with it. I, I did not talk to them or contact them or anything like that. The The radio station owned the rights, and the radio station was making the hire when Jim Irwin and Max McGee. Now, Jim became a friend of mine back when I was in Kansas City, and he came through with the Bucks. They they would play uh, Kansas City Kings, and I would always try to get together with them, and we'd have dinner or something on an off night. Uh, because, you know, I, obviously I was doing NFL, he's doing NFL, so we cross paths a lot. And I was always uh, interested to pick his brain on what's going on with the Packers and everything else. So when he decided to retire, um, you know, they said, what, would you be interested? And I said, uh, yeah, absolutely. And so, um, but we kept it pretty much under wraps and I, I didn't know how it was going to go. I didn't think it was going to happen. And, um, you know, it, it was a process of about four or five months. Um, and, you know, more than that, even before uh, I really started to find out, OK, maybe this is going to happen. Maybe this could happen. But I was happy in Chicago. I was doing a lot of things in Chicago at the time. Um, the Bears had moved from WGN to um, uh, another radio station, WMAQ at the time. And then, uh, you know, so I was working there instead of WGN. But I was still doing the Bulls on WGN TV. I was still doing Big Ten games on, on the uh uh, ESPN plus network all the time. And so, um, I was fine. I was, you know, I, I didn't need to move, but I thought, okay, if this does come up, if this does materialize, I said, um, you know, if I don't take a shot at it, if I don't express interest and, and throw my hat under the ring, so to speak, even under the covertly, um, that I would regret it, that, that I would, you know, but I, I also figured, okay, if I throw my hat in the ring and I don't get it, that's fine. But, um, when things started happening and one thing started leading to another and we came close to uh, a guy by the name of John Schweitzer, who was running WTMJ uh, at the time, he was, uh, he and I started getting close on this deal and I started saying, okay, well, this is going to be interesting. I didn't think uh, it would have much of an impact. I was in Chicago for 14 years, but I didn't quite at that time, uh, rather naive on my part and kind of stupid. Um, I didn't realize that, the play-by-play -play announcer had much of a, you know, an impact on a community. But you have to understand Chicago, and I didn't quite understand it even after 14 years. Chicago is the greatest sports market in America, bar none, and maybe the world. Why? Because people care. They care about every aspect of their teams, right down to the announcers. And I didn't realize that. I figured, well, if I leave, who cares? I mean, it's the Bears. They'll, you know, there's somebody else, and they've got, you know, They've got uh, I, Butkus at the time, or, uh, you know, Hub was doing the games, Hub Arkish and Dan Hampton, um, uh, Tom Thayer was coming aboard. You know, I mean, it, it, uh, I, I figured play by play, that's the least of the, you know, concerns. But I found that a lot of people were upset with me for leaving. And uh, that was twofold. Number one, I felt their wrath. But number two, I said to myself, gosh, I had an impact there I didn't realize. And so that made it a little hard at the very end. Um, and I think it was probably hard uh, on the Packers, too, because uh, John Schweitzer told me the story. You know, he went to Bob Harlan. He said this. We want to hire Wayne Larrabee. What do you think? Because he's doing the Bears. And obviously uh, we're on big stations and we're carried in Wisconsin and people know and all that. And, and Bob said, uh, you know, uh, Bob said, well, you're the broadcast guy. If you think this is the right thing to do, go ahead and do it. And so, you know. Uh, another man uh, probably wouldn't say that in Bob's position. But, um, you know, you're talking about Bob Harlan, who is, uh, you know, Hall of Fame in every aspect, not only as a professional, as the thing he, he the way he turned around um, that franchise, but as a person. And so um, 
and I had known Bob. I know knew his sons very well. Brian, his son, one of his sons was working as the assistant PR guy for the Bears. So um, there was some ties there. But uh, you know, Bob stepped up. He said, "Okay, well, this is going to be controversial, um, but if you think this is the right thing to do, John, go ahead." It's awesome. I, it's tremendous. I, I mean, it, it's we're first of all, we're glad you made the leap. You know, we're glad that this all the stars aligned and this worked out, Wayne. Obviously, well, you know, I got to tell you this. Um, it's interesting. Yeah, it, it's very interesting because once I did do that, uh, I had people in Chicago mad at me, and I had people in Wisconsin say, "What the hell are they doing hiring the voice of the Bears for the Packers?" Think about that. But you know what? It it worked yeah. out, and I'll tell you this. Um, the the I will never be able to accomplish anything greater than having broadcast a Super Bowl championship for the Bears and a Super Bowl championship for the Packers. That's something that uh, that I can take to my grave, and and uh, I'm very proud of that on both sides. Well, and hopefully we'll That's get uh, a few more before it's all said and done, Wayne. But I hope so. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Go ahead, Dan. Yeah, I, I mean, Wade, so you uh, came to Green Bay first season in, what, 1999 was your first season mm-hmm. broadcasting the Packers. Um, so by my count, 2024 is your 25th year uh, as the announcer for the Green Bay Packers, correct? Uh, actually, 26th. Yeah, the 25th was last year. You're all right, so you're going to your 26th year now. So congratulations. I mean, it's incredible longevity here um, in Green Bay. Um, so much has changed. The game has changed significantly. Um, you've seen, you know, in Green Bay, I mean, the city, my goodness, the, the, the change that's happened in and around Lambeau Field. Um, has anything surprised you in your tenure in Green Bay? Uh, or is there anything that's really stood out to you about this this kind of the either the game itself or or Green Bay or or the the team or you know just just you know what stands out to you during that time from '99 to now that maybe that the average person wouldn't be aware of. Well, the obvious, um, the success they've had. Um, you know, a few years ago, I said the Packers have never had sustained success like this in their history. They've had great moments, great periods of success. Curly Lambeau won three in a row and won, I think, five or six titles or whatever it was. Lombardi had the eight-year run where they won five championships. But to have the kind of success they've had, and I understand Packers fans are disappointed, only two championships, but they've had 30 years plus of sustained success where you can count the number of losing seasons on basically one hand. And so uh, this is something now, you know, it's never happened to the Packers, I don't know of any other franchise that's been on a run like that uh, in NFL history. I mean, maybe there's somebody might have been. I don't know. Dallas had a good 25-year run. Um, You know, the Vikings had a good 15, 20 years. Uh, You know, there's some other franchises that have been really good for a long period of time. But this is three decades now. And it's basically two quarterbacks going on a third. So this is really – that's the thing that stands out to me the most – And is it just the quarterbacks? I think the quarterbacks are a big part of it. But as an organization, you've got to put that quarterback in place and you've got to give that quarterback the tools to win. So this Packers franchise, since Bob turned it around, brought on Ron Wolf, um, you know, he hired Mike Holmgren. They made the decision to go after Brent Favre. Um, Since then, uh, this has been a well-run organization, especially on the football side. Have they had some losing time? Sure they have. Everybody does. Uh, But these guys have, and again, because they've gotten the quarterback right, uh, they've been able to stay on top uh, and and supplement that. But again, you can have great quarterbacks and they they may not win. You have to have some other tools, some other pieces in place as well. And so, you know, yeah, the quarterback's the number one reason. But it's also this organization has been very good over 30 years of putting enough pieces around those quarterbacks so that every almost every year, they contend. Absolutely. And Wayne, I, I, I know it would be pretty hard to answer this question because there's so many moments in the time that you've been a Packers broadcaster. Uh, and I don't want to phrase this in a way that would start a, a, a bar argument in a Sheboygan bar, but what what moments as a broadcaster for the Green Bay Packers really stand out to you? Um, I mean, it, it oftentimes 
in in our lines with uh, team success. But are there any top moments that really just are imprinted in your mind as as the Packer broadcaster? Um, my first game in 1999, uh, the opener uh, against Oakland, and John Gruden was on the sidelines for Oakland, and uh, it was a back and forth game. Um, I had my two sons with me, one of whom was helping me spot. He was he was in middle school, and he was becoming our he was going to be our spotter um, on on the games, and he did that for over ten years. Um, but here it is. It's early September. It's a rainy, kind of rainy day in Green Bay, warm and humid. Um, my two sons are with me, and we had just gotten in from Chicago, obviously, and uh, still getting acclimated and everything else. And it's back and forth. And Brett Favre leads this drive down the field. I think he hit Jeff Thomason, of all people, in the end zone of the touchdown pass to win the game in the final seconds. And it was just a huge emotional game, not only for the team, but but certainly for us. And I remember in, in the elevator going down from the press box to leave the stadium, uh, my oldest son, Scott, who had just become a freshman at the University of Wisconsin, he turns to me and says, <clears throat> well, Dad, this is why we came here to see Brett Favre lead the Packers on a dramatic win. And it really it crystallized everything. Yeah, that was the whole thing. Um, that given, okay, I will say that much. The best broadcast I ever did was a Christmas Eve game at Minnesota in 2004. It was the only game played that day. It was a four o'clock game in the Metrodome where the Packers, even with Reggie White and Brett Favre, never won, couldn't win. And yet this game was second to last game of the regular season. As I said, Christmas Eve, people were upset because the Packers were going to be playing when people are going to Christmas Eve mass. How could they do that? Um, but at any rate, this was an epic game. It was Favre and Dante Culpepper and back and forth and Donald Driver. And, uh, you know, it was just a huge game. And it came down to 34-31. They won it on a field goal by Ryan Longwell. And it was just super because that second to last game of the regular season, that was for the division championship. And, and it was such a significant win in Minneapolis. Um, but that was the best broadcast I did and one of the best games I've ever seen. Uh, but just from my standpoint, and, you know, media begins with me. So, uh, you know, that was that was one. But obviously the Super Bowl <laughs> run and the Super Bowl itself, um, Super Bowl 45. Uh, and, and, and I just think because, you know, my family was there in the whole bit, but in Dallas. And it was such a God's honest, awful week weather-wise. And, um, you know, if, if we were in a tough position as we are in Dallas to call a game, not easy to call a game from the corner of the end zone, but we got through it. We did it. And for the Packers to win that game, and uh, uh, that to me was the high point. It had to be the high point. And it was just, it was kind of the thing I started dreaming about when I was in that uh, little Mercury at Bosque Ski Area listening to the Ice Bowl, dreaming that, God, I'd love to be doing that someday, calling the Packers in a championship game. And here it was, the uh, big Super Bowl, and and they got the win. And, you know, it's funny. All of us would be telling you today that that was one of the worst weeks of our lives. But because the Packers won, it was one of the best weeks we've ever had. Oh, it's tremendous. It's tremendous uh, here, hearing you um, recount some of that. Um, you know, Wayne, looking ahead, I want to be mindful of your time uh, this evening, uh, but uh, I've got one last question for you. Um, how do you feel about the prospects for this Green Bay Packer team? I mean, la last season was a revelation. Jordan Love, um, that second half of the season was tremendous. I don't have to tell you that, uh, but the young weapons on offense, free agent acquisitions, uh, excited about the, the ad at safety, um, just excited about the youth of this team, some of the leadership here. So how are you feeling just prospects broadly for this 2024-2025 season? Oh, I'm excited. I'm excited about it. Um... You know, I, I thought what they accomplished last year. And, and let me say this. Um, last year was not easy. I mean, they entered the season with a new starting quarterback and all these rookies around him. I had never in – there was my 46th year in the NFL between Kansas City, Chicago, Green Bay. I had never seen a receiving core. I'm talking about tight ends and wide receivers now with as little experience as that group had. I'd never seen it, okay? I'm not being critical. I'm just saying – I, I've never seen, and I've seen some pretty bad teams over my career, but I've never seen anything like that in terms of inexperience 
at the receiver position like that. Now you got a first year quarterback. Um, and then you have a defense that is kind of, you know, fluctuating a little bit. They're trying, trying different things. They had to work different things. They came through some injuries. Um, I, I thought what LaFleur and his staff did with that team, they went 40 some days without winning a game. They were two and five at one point and to then get on a run and for their quarterback to get on the run, to, to start playing like Aaron Rodgers in his prime, to start doing that over the course of nine, 10 games and with those receivers, by those receivers, we knew, okay, I kept saying this through training camp. These guys are inexperienced, but they are good. They have talent. And for that to come together the way it did, um, as quickly as it did over the course of that one season, uh, that to me, wow, what a job they did. That was LaFleur's best coaching job. Don't tell me any different. His best team was the 2021 team, okay? The one that lost to San Francisco in Lambeau Field on a Saturday night on two bad special teams play plays. That was a better team than the one that got to the championship game and lost to Tampa Bay, okay? 21 was a very good Packers football team. But the best coaching job LaFleur did, and he had three 13-win seasons, by far, in my opinion, the best coaching job he did was last year. Because I'm telling you something, guys, that thing when they were losing four in a row and they're two and five, that thing could have easily gone right off the rails and nobody would have been surprised. It did not. And that's a credit to certainly LaFleur and his staff. And it's a credit to the players, those young players who hung with it as well. And that quarterback who never flinched even during the four-game losing streak. So I have a lot of hope uh, for this year. Xavier McKinney exactly what they need at safety, exactly what they need on the back end of that defense, okay? Now, they need another safety with him. Maybe it's Anthony Johnson, a kid they really like, seventh-round pick out of uh, Iowa State, but they like a cornerback, Harrington Valentine, um, out of Kentucky, a seventh-round pick, two guys last year. that They really like both those guys, and Valentine can play, and I suspect Johnson can play as well. Wouldn't surprise me to see them add another safety in this draft. And so I, I think the, Josh Jacobs, hate to see Showtime go. Um, Aaron Jones, all of us hate to see him go. Um, uh, that five-game streak down the stretch, okay? Four, uh, no, three in the regular season, two in the postseason. Five straight 100-yard rushing performances. Nobody's done that in the history of the franchise. Not Jim Taylor, not Paul Horning, not Amon Green, the all-time leading rusher. No one. Um, he picked up that young team, and down the stretch, he carried them into the playoffs and a little bit beyond. So we hate to see him go. Um, but uh, Josh Jacobs is a workhorse kind of back. He's a guy who can play all three downs. Um, he's a guy who can you know, give you week-in, week-out production. Um, you know, is he as uh, uh, special as, as Aaron Jones? I don't know. Uh, I don't think he has um, some of the huge playability that Aaron Jones brings to the party. But I do know this. He's about three years younger and he's healthy. Uh, and I think this kid's going to be a great addition to this offense. So I'm really looking forward to this coming season because I think I'm really looking forward to the draft because they have a chance. Five picks in the first 100. They can move up and down, or they can get five good players and plug them in uh, as they go along. And if they have a draft as good as last year's draft, this team is on its way. Trust me. Um, but the other factor to keep in mind, as high as I am on um, the quarterback uh, and as well as he played, he played better than Favre in Favre's first year. He played better than Aaron Rodgers in Aaron Rodgers' first year as a starter. Okay, But understand something about quarterbacks. It's not just one year. It's can you stack success, as Mike McCarthy used to say? Can you, how good will he be this year when everybody knows about him? He's not sneaking up on anybody. Everybody knows about him. And the, the coaching and the scheming that's done in the NFL is second to none. Can, if Jordan Love is as good as he was this past year, this year, then you know you've got maybe the third potential Hall of Fame quarterback. Uh, I suspect he is. Um, I had an interesting conversation with John Eric Sullivan before the San Francisco game, the playoff game, on the sidelines. We were talking about that. And then, and I mentioned, you know, that, um, gosh, uh, he, he, this kid's really come on. He's done really well. And I said, boy, uh, you know, what will be interesting to see is what happens in year two. And, and John Eric said, you know, the thing we liked about him was we felt that if we got him in here and he started and he had a success, 
that he would not lose um, the, the workmanship that got him there. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. It would not go to his head. He would not slack off. They, they felt great about the intangibles, about the person that he is. In other words, he's had a lot of success. There are a lot of people blowing smoke at him right now, okay? A lot of people saying, you're the greatest thing. Hey, you're the third Hall of Fame quarterback in a row in Green Bay. Well, none of that's true yet. No, that's way premature. But I guarantee it, they're writing about it in the uh, Press Gazette and the uh, Journal Sentinel and on the Athletic and everywhere. They're saying Packers are Super Bowl contenders. And, and you know, so the expectations this year, how will Jordan handle that? Well, the, I, I know this. The scouts who know him best, who, the reason he was selected where he was and when he was is because they believe he has the work ethic and the character to be great. He certainly has the physical to talent. They wouldn't have drafted him there if he didn't. The intangibles are what separate quarterbacks in this league. They believe that kid has the intangibles. I'm anxious to see it. I think he does too. Yeah, absolutely. And Wayne, I, we couldn't agree with you more uh, about Coach LaFleur. And uh, certainly just look at – uh, I don't think he was ever on the hot seat, even had they struggled a little bit down the, the stretch by any means. But the imprint he now has on the coaching staff, changes that they made uh, to the staff uh, in the offseason, bringing in a whole new strength and conditioning staff uh, led by Aaron Hill. Those are not types of changes that Packers organization is typically making coming off of a strong finish in a playoff run like they did this season. So, um, so I think uh, Coach LeFleur and in his uh, personality and his fingerprints are now all over every part of this organization. So I think that's very exciting as Packer fans to see moving forward. But Wayne, uh, we don't have any other questions. We really appreciate you coming on. Uh, folks, you need to tune in. Uh, Wayne, you've got uh, an awesome podcast uh, with legendary fellow po- uh, uh, announcer, Matt LePay, uh, Larry yeah. and LePay. So folks need to check that out. Uh, and check then out you that, mentioned. Yes. Yeah, you mentioned that uh, you're going to be uh, doing a draft show on 93.7, the game coming up here as the draft is rapidly approaching. Um, <laughs> so, folks, check that out. Wayne, we wish we could talk to you Pat, about Packers all night, but so appreciate you coming on. Before we let you go, yeah. we'd be remiss if you didn't give us a that is your dagger, uh, go pack, go something that you can, there is your dagger. You can get us excited yeah. about. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well guys, I hope you'll have me on again. It was a pleasure talking to you and uh, would look forward to, to Please. another appearance somewhere down the line. But, uh, and, uh, I guess that's it for tonight. There is your dagger. <laughs> that is wonderful. Thanks so much, Wayne. It was a pleasure wow. as always you, be legendary and go pack, go, go pack, Thank go you guys. Have a good one. Thank you. Every year I know we're going to go hard. We've been that team ever since Bart Starr. All my cheese heads go pack go. Ain't show with no mercy, cutting no slack, no. I ain't a bad sport and I'll even wish you good luck.